Uh, thanks for coming to my talk. Uh, more of you than uh, I was expecting, actually, to be honest, and uh, that's just adding to my nerves. But I've got a lot to get through, um, so I'll ask you to hold back your questions to the end. Um, then be able to um, so, quickly, introduction for me, um, Chris Lander. i um, been working for Energize Work for the last seven or 15 years in the industry. Um, I work Energize Work, I'll tell you a little bit about the company as we go through the presentation, but it's Energize with a Z, like my name, awkwardly spelled with a K, and not Works, Work, it's not a cheap rip-off of Thought Works. Actually, if you, any guys uh, uh, if you've read Ken Beck's original book on extreme programming, he talks about what Energize Work is, and that's one of our uh, big values about always working when you feel like working, never work overworking, etc, etc, so I invite you to have a look at that. Um, so I handed out some feedback forms to everybody um, because I thought since this was a pre uh, presentation about outcomes I should maybe try and define them. Normally I do this in collaboration with everybody um, but I'm making some assumptions based on uh, what you've seen for the brief for the talk. Um, the top two I guess are my, are my primary goals. Um, the bottom three are kind of secondary. So if you just rate yourself on a scale of one to five with five being I know everything about this. Um, zero being I know nothing at all about this. Quick question, who um, here has uh, been to the Agile on the Beach talk last year about Agile contracts? Okay, just one of a few. Um, I'm going to try not to tread old I ground. Actually, I actually gave that talk. I actually gave that talk. <laughs> <laughs> it looked like a good talk, and actually you probably did, did a much better job than me of talking about agile contracts. I will talk about them a little bit. Um, who here has been involved in a commercial negotiation between yourself and another company to either cure or deliver software? Oh. A lot more than I thought, actually, for that. So that's that's good. That'll be interesting. Hopefully, you'll, you'll share a few of the pains that uh, you've gone through over the years. Right. So um, this is a quick teaser about what Energize Work is about today. Um, we help companies design, manage, and deliver programs of work which revolve around technology. It doesn't get much more specific than that these days. Um, we focus on aligning our engagement to the business strategy of clients to achieve positive outcomes. Realising outcomes forms the basis of our contractual obligation to our clients and part of our payment is determined um, by measuring the impact on business value for our clients. So, with contracts to deliver outcomes, what I really want to tell you is the story of how we got there. Um, I'll share a few specifics at the end and we'll see where we get to in the time that we've got to turn my day. So far, two minutes like that. Um, so, a little bit of a history of Energise work. Um, Early 2000s, uh, that's when I pretty much started in the software industry, and to be quite honest, it wasn't much fun. <laughs> um, I either had a mixture of horrible waterfall processes where they tried to squeeze the life out of anything that was interesting about doing software that I'd fallen in love with at university, um, or I was uh, working for some crazy dot com startup that was just the most organised chaos I'd ever seen in my life in a couple of instances. Uh, the results were pretty much the same, failure everywhere, lots of money spent, um, deadlines not meet, working ridiculously, uh, overwork. Um, I'm sure uh, lots of people can identify with that story, they probably still do, and occasionally, and I do today, it still happens, but maybe not as much as it used to, I hope. Um, but then um, I began to get exposed to various agile um, practices and techniques and principles of the new christened Agile community in 2001. Uh, I was started out as a developer, the first things were really around test driven development and continuous aut automation, but then I started to work on projects that were on Scrum and XT, etc. Um, and you know, there was sort of small successes here and there. I didn't really feel like this was changing the world um, at the time, but there were things, especially in my personal practice, test driven development, that I could see that how this was valuable. Um, in 2006, I had the fortune, and I and actually <coughs> reflecting on it, I think it was as much about luck um, of being in the right place at the right time with the right people as I think a lot of the people that had really positive successes with agile adoption was. 
Um, we had a, a great singular business stakeholder. Um, I had a great product manager who was really the owner of the product and could make product decisions and didn't have to just uh, uh, correlate them all from various stakeholders. Um, I had two excellent um, XP coaches in the form of uh, Simon Baker and Gus Power, if you've heard of either of them. Uh, they've got a bit of a reputation on the Agile scene. Um, and we had a great team of people. And we had no dependencies on the organization that we were in, which was a nice little Agile bubble for us to do uh, great things. And we did. Um, we had a step change in productivity. Um, I was so happy to be walking through the doors of the offices every morning. Um, it was just like night and day from what I'd been used to up until that point. And that success, which was largely around being able to just ship code reliably um, to, to a high quality, was what we thought success was at that time. It was shipping features, um, it was not having massive defect rates, and it was um, keeping on top of things like technical debt. And that's how we measured our success. Um, the, next the next time, uh, oh sorry, I meant to say, that was what basically, let that team led to the foundation of Energized Work and I was one of the people on that team and there's still people in the company today that were part of that team. Um, so then, well, our first commercial engagement was actually to go um, and try and replicate the same thing. Somebody at AOL had seen us in action, said, and moved to another company and said, uh, you guys really need to come over here and help me uh, sort some problems out. They had a big um, project rescue on, uh, another horror story, three million pounds of a five million pound budget spent, um, and basically nothing to show for it in 18 months. And so we came in, you know, all gung ho, basically, oh, we've got all the answers, um, we're gonna repeat the same trick that we did in our previous company. Um, this was a bit of a wake-up call, though, because it was a lot more complicated um, stakeholder um, uh, involved in terms of the business, our interactions with business and other IT managers and architects and all kinds of that. We had to really prove ourselves this time around. We didn't just get given some space to get on with it and, and trust us to do it. We had to like make a case for why what we were doing was actually adding more value, and this was one of the first challenges, we started to look at simply how much money we were putting into the team and how many users we were requiring and what that rate of user growth was. It was very macro metric, but it was a good barometer of how well the te team was doing. And we kind of adopted things from the kind of lean and theory of constraints world at this point where we're focusing on things like work cycle time and all those good things and showing the business with cumulative flow diagrams that if you release early and often it's much better than making a big <coughs> splash that's obviously high risk um, even though you get to have a big marketing campaign about it which is often uh, one of the reasons why the business likes big releases. Um, so that, but again we were successful over time, we proved what we were doing. And then Simon Gus, in particular, were invited then to help out with the governance of the rest of the division, and all the other teams were there. And they took this kind of very financial lens of looking at whether the teams were creating value um, and applied it to all the other teams whilst we were adopting the same kind of agile processes that we kind of spearheaded at the start. Now, this started to raise very big challenges with people outside of where our area of like, control and um, autonomy was uh, with business strategy basically and um, started to really point the finger at certain teams that whilst they might be good teams they weren't really delivering much value um, and we realized that actually the thing that had the most impact on whether these teams were returning any value wasn't whether we could go faster anymore um, it was whether we could actually make and help make product strategy decisions. Um, and they were a far bigger risk to uh, ROI. So that was one of the, that was one of our kind of learnings is as we started to get closer to the business strategy decisions. So, similar project that we had not long after was then about helping the business actually come up with um, an IT and, and business strategy. Um, similarly, we had a team set up that was delivering. We, what we were doing is we were actually building a kind of proof of concept prototype to validate the business strategy and the existing IT platform that we were building to build a trading platform. 
But what we ran into here is um, it's all right to look at return on value when you're in kind of you know delivery mode and you kind of know where you're going. But this was actually about discovering information. Um, and when we went through the whole process, we had a great product owner. He was always giving us the next thing he wanted an answer to the question to. And as a team, on a day-to-day -day basis, we were very effective and we discovered lots of interesting things along the way that we thought were valuable. However, when we had a big meeting with the, the board of this company, who are very high-powered financial types, um, they pretty much said, well, how? I, this is all great, interesting report, but how does that impact on the, um, the bottom line? How uh, is this information helping us make better decisions that create value for us? The irony of this is that actually in the finance world, they're quite good at doing things like pricing information and risk management. We didn't have the tools then to do this very effectively. Um, so uh, I picked out a few of the agile um, principles to kind of express where we were, uh, how our journey. If you look at the terms on the left, they're the ones that we were, we were good at, especially in the early days uh, that we got very good at. But the ones on the left are the ones that actually I think were kind of unanswered questions in our mind. Um, we come a long way and I think a lot of people have shared this journey, um, you know, doing just being more responsive and being predictable um, and the, the discipline techniques get you to a certain level of maturity. I know a lot of teams talk about, um, that some people talk about agile maturity levels. Um, and also just the power of self-organizing teams. I think everybody's been in that, or I hope all of you have had the chance to experience that in my uh, genuinely collaborative environment where there's a lot of visibility and transparency and all the good things. However, um, for us at least, and I, and I think this is something we've seen elsewhere, um, measuring progress, often um, our teams and teams with other teams that we've seen are either focused on output or they're being measured on <coughs> output. So velocities and features become a proxy for productivity. Um, good design, and this is something I'll explore a bit more later, but it, we talk about this in the Agile Manifesto, um, it's a good principle. However, Agile methods um, have never really addressed good design, uh, user experience design, technical design, and I think actually I've seen quite a few talks that are actually starting to talk about this. Um, valuable uh, work or software connecting what we're doing to actual value and to the strategy of the company and balancing multiple stakeholder requirements, that's also um, a, a challenge that we certainly didn't have to uh, address or didn't have good tools to address. Um, Simon Baker, the, the founder and CEO of um, Energize Work, he, uh, I invite you to go and check out his paper. He had to do that as part of the Agile um, 10 years on um, as a Gordon Pass Award winner called Noble. Um, it's as blunt and as direct as he is in real life if you've ever met him. Um, and it talks about a lot of these things and a whole lot more. It's good um, stuff. So I'm trying to connect back to the commercial side of things now of like our approach when we were going through these different various clients and selling. Um, who's kind of been through an RFP um, process? Okay, right. Um, I mean, my experience has been extremely variable because um, often clients, uh, they're not experts in kind of managing uh, people who build software, in fact. Um, so they are they provide some kind of brief, maybe if you're lucky you get a requirement specification that defines some stories, some wireframes, uh, they cover a lot of ground, it's highly ambiguous, you know there's going to be lots of stuff missing, um, but what clients generally want is you to try and demonstrate that you can deliver something uh, within their budget, and that's something you can't, I tend to find that you can't get away from very easily. Um, you know, requirements look something like this. Uh, if I I've had the time, I'd ask you to pick apart this uh, user story. Um, I'm sure you can find lots of horrible things in there and why that's a very poor definition of the user story. Um, and you might have 50 of those. Um, and then you get thrown in arbitrary performance requirements because they've read that five nines is the new standard of that time on websites. So that's also a good thing to have. We'll throw that in there. Um, and this is the question that they all keep coming back to, generally. Um, 
but we know in our experience, you know, estimation with this, it's certainly to pin it down to something accurate, something tangible is going to be very hard. Um, we can maybe pigeon it into a range that isn't good enough normally for clients. Um, these performance requirements and any external dependencies of bigger icebergs that can blow everything out. Um, and we don't have a good understanding of what to prioritise at this point. Um, so we generally have always pitched, well, look, we'll, we'll get you something, in, especially if it's a website, we'll get you something into production the first week, we'll do short statements of work, and you'll go on an investment cycle, and you can start and stop whenever you want, and we'll just charge on a time and materials basis. We try to be as agile for our clients <coughs> as possible, but they still keep coming back to this question, how much and how long. So we might spend some time um, to try and uh, nut out all the differences in, in opinion and where the gaps are. Um, we always try and normally we end up with a scope that's a quarter of the size of the original RFP to so try and get it down to an MVP. Um, then the hope is that we can get something that is vaguely, you know, we can get a sensible estimate that doesn't end up being outside the client's budget and doesn't end up uh, basically pricing us and us not making any money. Um, and time is always against both sides. It's for the supplier, you've got big cost of sales. For the client, they've normally got a deadline to meet as well, along with a you know fixed price. Um, and you know, if we're lucky, then we kind of work out a good relationship with the client at this point. We've had the conversations, and they buy into us. And often, most of our work has been on a reputation basis. So, um, but it doesn't always work out that way. Um, Quite often you're up against other people that are all too happy to say, oh yes, we'll uh, deliver that, that money, but by the way, every change that you want to that specification is going to cost you. Um, so, if you do end up in this situation, sometimes you have to enter into some contractual agreement um, and say, we'll do it for this much. Um, and we always try and, you know, discover and deliver iteratively, but we know that the contract can come back to biters and similarly the client, you know, likes us to focus on value, but they still probably have some business plan that they're being expected to keep to and they've got deadlines and they don't want to go over budget. Contracts, will they help or hinder when the going gets tough? Our experiences that normally they uh, get in the way, not help. So contracts quickly, I'm going to be as quick as possible. Um, quick definition, read that. The elements really are offer and acceptance, which is that both sides agree and understand what the other has said, basically. Um, a promise to perform, and that's language is interesting, it's lawyer language now. Um, and consideration, which is the payment. I think performance, and if you read the legalese and how they define this, they always kind of the definition of the thing that the person's going to perform, basically, you know, it's like, here are the instructions, you do this and we'll give you some money. Uh, I think that's kind of part of the, part of the problems that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, and pricing models, I mean, it's not much to be said about them. They're, they're fixed price, whether or whether it's time and materials. The, the thing that really is key is, for the client, fixed price is less risk and it's more risk for the supplier, and for the other pricing models, it's a lot more risk for the client, um, and a lot less risk for the supplier. So, you know, there isn't really a happy one for either to choose in those cases, I don't think. So, uh, traditional contracts kind of tend, and I know this has been spoken about uh, previously, um, <coughs> they tend to fail in the same uh, ways as uh, waterfall software development, uh, big specification up front, makes the assumption that we know everything. Um, client still has lots of risk because they are, they are specifying what they want done, but not necessarily what they need to produce uh, a return on investment. Contract makes responding to change undesirable and expensive. And the worst one of them all, fixed price, fixed scope, fixed time. Uh, we know what happens to quality in that equation. <coughs> so, we asked uh, 100 Agile practitioners to name reasons that fixed price, fixed scope contracts continue to be the most common form of contract for software procurement, which they do, unfortunately. I've got a few, but this is actually from guys in the office and, and the company, not 100. Uh, easy to understand. I think people forget this one. Um, 
it's just simply cognitive ease. And a lot of stuff that we do is actually, I think, around this cognitive ease factor. I will get x for y by a. Um, prevailing belief that software is like other construction industries. We have to stop talking about building software if we do not want to be taught, treated like construction workers. We are not. We are designers. We are engineers. I will not use. I don't even like using the word developer anymore. I think it, it's dangerous. Um, easiest to align with traditional business planning and budgeting. Um, so if you were in the keynote this morning. Um, there's a lot of other factors of the big machine that kind of force us into this model and in fact often there are policies um, that the legal department and the procurement department have that enforce this so um, government contracts in the states have to be fixed price, they're not allowed to be um, other types. Um, this belief that the client thinks they know what they want and that's what they need and that they can actually express it in terms of the, in, in written language in a, in a contract and often, uh, like I said, the client isn't necessarily the most software um, or technology literate, um, that isn't what they do, that's exactly why they're buying you to do the um, uh, work for them. A client feels that they're the ones offloading the really risk and responsibility to the supplier. We know that also that doesn't tend to turn up uh, as it is. And also, this is another one that we came up with. Client often will, a fixed price means you can really negotiate quite hard on that. And you can say, right, I want that, and I want, I want a bit less. And you get to beat the supplier down on price. But the supplier is also, a lot of them are equally uh, uh, eager to put in clauses that make change and claw that value back. So it hits the client and supplier against each other. So, obligatory uh, slide about how bad we all are, um, or how bad the software development world is. Um, what, the reason I pinched this slide from another deck of ours, I, I think that the contract model generally sets us up for this in many cases and actually makes these numbers a lot worse if we looked at big government procurement or anywhere where there is a uh, non software or technology business purchasing of a technology um, integrator or supplier. So um, I won't go, because I know time it will probably be against me, um, I won't go into too much detail in all the clashes versus Agile and, con um, and contracts, but they're obvious, I've kind of talked about them all, Big Bang uh, versus Evolutionary, um, defining and finding scope into the contract. Um, and the supplier generally is incentivized to fulfill the contract, not necessarily satisfy the client. So Agile contracts, um, these were talked about uh, last year. Um, so this is, uh, I should have caveated this at the start, a lot of this is my personal beliefs and our beliefs as a company. Um, but I believe that, that most of them attempt to align better around Agile methods and not necessarily Agile principles. Um, so they do the things like fixing the price, um, <coughs> pricing model is similar, fixed price, time and materials, that's nothing particularly innovative, but in iterative incremental states of work to keep the scope size down to small chunks so we can then make uh, adjustments, uh, or actually provisions for the scope of work to change in the contract or even finish early. So uh, there's a couple of examples, again, uh, since I, I was a bit worried that all of you, or half of you, would have seen the talk from last year, I didn't want to go into too much detail. Um, optional scope contracts are something that Ken Feck came up with. Um, he basically said that you fix the price uh, per iteration and the time that, that iteration goes on, but you vary the scope and you have a fixed quality. I did notice in his paper he talks about quality in terms of kind of code metrics and test coverage. I would argue that isn't a very good measure of quality of your delivery. Um, you'll see why I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, and who was it? Jeff Sutherland. Um, he proposed money for nothing change free. I kind of like this one a little bit better. Um, again, similarly, you can um, change the scope on each iteration within the contract. Um, you can take things out, push things in, as long as they're kind of similar sizes. And you get to cut the projects short for a fee if. Um, the, if the client believes I'm not getting any more return on investment, 
you can basically say, okay, well, I'll pay to buy you out for the rest of the contract, which is a lot less than being forced to go on the remainder of the contract. And then some crazy people have decided that it might be a good idea to do it on some kind of agile metrics, basically, which um, for anybody that doesn't realize this, uh, things like story points and velocity points are about capacity planning. They are nothing to do with measuring productivity. That's why this is a really bad idea, and it can easily be gamed as well. So, as I said, they because I think they focus on me methods, and agile methods, not agile principles, are largely about the iterative incremental uh, delivery and responding to change. Agile methods don't make explicit ways of defining what business value really is, uh, uh, and well, certainly the majority of implementations that I've seen and therefore they don't have a means to measure the progress in terms of business value. And also they don't really provide um, good context for what, how well what you're delivering has to do to achieve that business value. And this is uh, an important consideration for the design problem that I mentioned earlier. So this is now the last few years of work for the company. Um, We've had various inspirations along the way. Um, I disagree with JB's uh, statement in his keynote where he said Lean Startup is just uh, another branding of Agile. Uh, I guess if you look at it in a very general definition, you might be able to argue that. The main value that I got from Lean Startup as primarily a software developer was that it forced me to look at a business as a system and understand all the parts of the system. I say to you that it is incumbent on anybody in the software industry that works in a software business that you should understand the basics of how a business works. And that was the value of Lean Startup for me. And it forces everybody, if you're, in a, if you're lucky enough to work in that environment, you actually confront all the business assumptions and risks like you do any other risks in an agile project and risk in agile delivery. Um, so this was enlightening for me. I learned a lot by actually studying all the theory around the business. The method itself, okay, yeah, we, we know what going around in the iterative loop looks like. But it's optimized for learning and discovery, and this is also very powerful. Many people have talked about how learning is the constraint of teams, really, ultimately. Um, and also, uh, if you've read Fifth Discipline uh, about the learning organization, there's this idea that the only competitive advantage you can sustain is learning faster than competition. Everything else is uh, up for grabs. <coughs> Similarly, uh, a big one for me personally, um, if you haven't come across Don Reinerson's work, um, he basically took uh, the lean principles for manufacturing and properly reevaluated them in terms of product development. We take a lot of ideas from um, lean manufacturing that aren't actually appropriate to software development or design. Um, and he kind of has some good insights into why you don't actually want to reduce variability necessarily because you don't want to um, reduce the chances of a good payoff or a discovery of something very valuable. And he also has a great prioritization tool called Cost of Delay and CE3. I um, invite you to look at that. But what it does really is prioritize value over time, which forces the business into a conversation to say, What's the biggest value we can generate from the smallest increment of effort and work in this amount of time? And that for forces you to really optimize for things like cycle time. So I've got, sorry, I should have mentioned before, book recommendations at the bottom. Um, go and read. This is a very terse read and hard work, but it's full of uh, uh, brilliant insights. Um, the last one is Tom Gill. Um, who Gus Power actually, uh, the other founder of Energize Work, is the, he's kind of like now uh, so bought into this and it's becoming um, it, across the whole company. And he, whilst there's many things that seem kind of heavyweight on the surface, he's always had the idea of basically optimizing for stakeholder outcomes and value from the start. So that's the thing about his methods. And he actually makes sure that he try to uh, numerically quantify um, the outcomes in some way. You also make some very clear language distinctions about requirements being where you're trying to get to versus designs, the means to get there. That's become part of our language now as a company. We're always arguing about whether something's really a requirement or whether this is a design idea. Um, and he has great methods for doing what I would call proper engineering. 
um, and proper architecture. Um, and if you want to lock some grenades into a meeting, uh, have a look at 12 tough questions and uh, throw that into your stakeholders and, and have some interesting conversation. You also had this idea of uh, no cure, no pay, um, which I'll, I'll say why that was inspirational for us as well. So a bit more history, um, where we started to apply some of this stuff. Um, where, where am I? Oh yeah, uh, this was a, a, a strategy discovery process where we were asked to kind of come up with the IT strategy for um, uh, BOD, basically video on demand services and uh, IP services. Um, and when we started to define things in terms of outcomes, because we could only determine, we could only define in outcomes, because in the, when you're talking about the time horizon of years, uh, requirements just obviously are, are a ridiculous thing to do and uh, functional specifications. Um, the business really bought into this, and this is when we went, ah, this, this is actually a powerful way for communicating with the business about what the business wants and needs and what the strategy is. But it was interesting that the IT department, IT guys weren't so uh, enamored by this because they actually said, but you know, you've got an idea of what you think you would do to actually meet the needs of the business. And we said, yeah, but it's going to be redundant by the time you get to starting to implement this, so we're not going to do that. So, but it does give the framework for the teams that are going to implement it, the, the context that they need to engineer and design good solutions to the problem. And this is like my question, my point about design that I'm talking about earlier, and why I think this is so important in our work now. Um, the, this is a, a big challenge for us as an industry as we go kind of beyond just agile um, and shipping features, um, small story cards, and getting websites out. Um, so another project where we um, we're using this in a kind of a, a discovery engagement again, kind of IT strategy to figure out how to replace a, a big legacy system, very technical project, um, figuring out what to do with uh, hundreds of thousands of lines of uh, some PIC universe, which is this uh, crazy archaic language from the 60s, very interesting project. But we were then defining the goals for our stakeholders. We were then using, um, both evaluating design options for discovery of new information from the literacy system, and we were doing it to um, evaluate the best technical approach. And that provided the frame for the legacy replacement in terms of outcome in the business. So this is kind of high level strategy stuff. I'll connect it to something a bit lower down the level. I worked uh, with, on a startup engagement, um, and we went through that whole um, process, procurement process very much like what I described in the um, RFP section where we were finding it difficult to come to an agreement about, look, we just need to get on and help you build this. And startups are just so full of uncertainty, you, you won't know, you can't specify what the right thing to do is, you don't know, even know what the MVP is. So what we agreed to do is initially start on a time and materials basis for a very short time to establish product uh, business and product goals, basically the lean startup kind of approach where we focused on the outcomes for the business, you know, impacting on number of sales, how much the customers like their product, and the ability of the merchants to complete um, certain business activities. So a merchant's ability to take a payment at some point, a mobile um, point of sale system. So then we kind of agreed with them, and it was a fairly subjective thing of how much as a technology partner, we were contributing to meeting their company product strategy um, objectives. And then we actually tied part of our payment to actually, if we hit the goals within certain ranges and so on, we get either less or more money. And that was a big sort of deal for us as well. Was, uh, we thought this is, the, this is the way to go. And they bought into that, that's the important thing. They, they knew that they were gonna get some value out of the money that they were paying us. Um, so, outcome-based approach. Ten minutes. So that's it. I think I'm going to be okay. Um, so this isn't by no. What, what I will point out is none, none of this is easy. It's actually really hard, but it's worth it. Uh, why? Uh, aligning uh, shared defined understanding of what's value across your organisation, across your stakeholders, specifically who you're delivering value for. Um, having good 
outcomes or goals or whatever you want to call them for your team is a much bigger factor on how successful that team is going to be than pretty much anything else. And that's a lot of what research is actually telling us about teams now. So this is really important. Um, and if you've got something that's quantifiable, it might not necessarily, it's still fuzzy often, but it provides just a lot more rational conversation for having the arguments in the meetings about what is valuable and what isn't and whether we're going in the right direction or not. Um, I'll, yeah, read the other two. The one that is a really big benefit, I think, for us, though, is this more design freedom. Um, because, and what it means is we try and push everything to make sure they really are genuinely requirements, ends, and then that allows us to be much more collaborative with our clients in actually figuring out what is, what is going to have the most impact, and especially if we tie it into how we get paid. Um, and that closes the feedback loop. I don't see that in, uh, and if I think of my teams in the past and, and other companies that we work with, is closing this feedback loop on how effective what we are, the solutions we're building are. Um, that's uh, something I think this solves. Okay, so, like I said, it's not easy. Um, when you fail, you can't hide it, but I think everybody can learn from it, especially ourselves, but often it means that the um, goals are shared between everybody. Um, so there's a kind of shared ownership of that failure. Um, it's very hard to reduce uh, engagements down to these engagement goals. It doesn't necessarily take a lot of time if you can get the right people in the right room, but it is like it is hard work in terms of it's very intense. You know, we normally do a two or three day workshop to kick this thing off, and it's exhausting. Um, and also, when you do that, you might all of a sudden realise that certain people in the company don't get on with, well with each other. Um, and they'll start having arguments about something, and you've uh, rattled the load of skeletons out of the cupboard. And some clients, depending on what level you're working with, and this is something we're quite fussy about these days, is you need to be acting with the person at the right level of the um, organisation that is, actually wants to deliver value. Some of them just want to spin up big teams in delivery and say, I've got 60 people working for me, um, and we're doing lots of stuff, and I'm important. Um, so. You know, so this doesn't agree with everyone, but I think it's a good filter for people who you do want to work with. So this is what we came and try and bring it back all around. If we thought outcomes are now the deliverable, then we thought, well, we should attempt to put these in our contracts. Um, and that's what we're doing now. Um, every engagement must have engagement goals, defined as outcomes for the client, so it has to align with the client's interest. Client outcomes will be part of our contractual agreements, and that's a strategy decision for us as a company. And we are going a step further in trying to, um, up to a third of the value of the contract, can be basically go up or down based on um, risk and reward on impact of those measurements. And we're trying to get away from selling our time, but just uh, we want to sell on value and the value that we create. So, I haven't really got time to go into all of these, um, but these are some of the things that we're putting in our contracts these days. Um, you see that like, some of them are better than others, actually, I'll, I'll say that now. Um, but generally, what they're trying to define is future state, some point in the, in the future, and a measurement. And you'll see that the contexts are pretty wide ranging here. Some of them are like almost qualitative, sort of stakeholder um, measures. Some of them are about, um, we actually started designing our processes now and putting measurements around, say, governance process that we're designing for a client. And some of them are, you know, these are more familiar to the techies among you that are actually about, you know, performance requirements of a system. Um, but whatever, whatever level and whoever we're interfacing on, we're trying to bring it up to their level of what they care about, not what they think they, they should get us to do. Um, so really, this is almost a bit of a pitch. Uh, this is a bit of an experiment for us. We've by no means uh, figured it all out. We're trying to kind of bring together quite a few different um, areas of thinking, the ones, the inspirations that I mentioned, and a lot more. Um, but what we believe is, is I think that um, a lot of people have been building things 
fast for a long time in the Agile community and a lot of them have not really understood how that is connecting to creating value and that's been um, demotivating for a lot of people. I've seen uh, JB talked about um, Agile um, regressing in a lot of companies and I wonder whether this is because we're not measuring the right things at the right level to give people like the really motivation to say this is how my work connects. So there's a belief in us that this is the foundation for success and that it gives us, it promotes trust in that relationship really early on at the contract stage if we're working with clients. And it allows us to come up with better creative solutions to realize outcomes. Um, so as I said, yeah, better commercial relationships. Okay, cool. I've actually made it. I'm, I'm amazed. Um, a lot there. So I've got feedback forms. Um, just now, like, fill in your after uh, thoughts. If you want to leave me a message or anything, any written feedback, do that on the back. Um, gratefully received. And I might be able to squeeze in a few minutes. Of, um, few minutes what of do you think of that? Is that cool? into break in about five minutes but there's, there's plenty of time for questions so we can overrun a little bit um, and, and energized I can see why your company's called energized and why you're so slim <laughs> okay right at the back thank you um, these outcomes are those sort of sliding scales then so you, yeah um, yeah and I think of, um, and in the keynote this morning how do you pronounce his name is it Barney yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, he got it absolutely bang on with some of these measurements. It needs to be a sliding scale, it needs to be relative to you and your team, and you need to be um, in collaboration of designing those measurements. They can't be targets basically being pushed down onto teams and saying, you have to do this. It's something that you co-design together just in the way that if I was going to do this talk the right way, I would sit down and say, well, I've got all this information about this, what would you guys like to hear about? And, um, and co-design the measures, and then I can see how well I've done at the end. But does, does that mean that the team side wants to stop because it comes into some sort of diminishing returns? Is it more? Uh, I mean, uh, for us, it's just so often there is some kind of governance um, process that we're implementing now. We, what we tend to do is try and have some kind of uh, wrapper that's like an investment cycle of like how much you're going to kind of bet on the next few developments and phases of work and so on. And then you come back to get together and say, well, we bet we thought that these design ideas were going to have the biggest impact on our outcomes. Oh, actually, this one didn't work very well at all. This one actually looks like it's a really good idea. We should do more of that, etc., etc. So it becomes part of your planning cycle, really. Look, we're actually doing that as a company. We have kind of a rolling planning cycle where we do a kind of five quarter vision into the future and a rolling quarterly planning and then monthly planning cycles. And we have key measurements for the company that we're kind of basically trying to impact on everything from how happy that everybody in the crew is to how many leads we have on sales. Um, so that you have to have that kind of uh, governance process in check. But I think, I mean, a lot of teams are, are reasonably good at kind of doing that retrospective or that plan do check. Because I'm just wondering where the negotiation happens because if you've got some sort of relationship between your outcomes and, uh, you know, like your server performance or something and how much you're getting paid and uh, you know, yeah and I think this is at each, each point uh, because well sometimes it's hard like for instance some of those discovery engagements it's actually h quite hard to say how valuable that is to the client so we might actually go with the um, fixed price in that point and then it's kind of maybe there's a little bit of bonus that's why we're kind of varying that risk reward component Tom Gill talks about doing basically no cure no pain now, uh, if we were all uh, exceptionally rich and could just afford to take that chance at every time, then we put that is the model that we kind of like to get to. But how do you do a good pricing, say, of information, of the value of information? So for us, engagements often start out as a very initial short kind of time and materials. Let's figure out what the goals are, what we're going to do to measure. And as the engagement goes on, the next contract starts to embed more of these kind of um, performance requirements or uh, outcomes into the contract that we can measure ourselves as we go along. So okay. it kind of evolves. Cool. That, that was three questions. Yeah. <laughs> and that was two presentations. Next one. <laughs> so um, if you've got your, uh, your dependency on your, your outcomes, um, you've 
obviously got to have a good trust that the client's actually going to pick the features that they implement that are actually going to deliver on those outcomes. So well, the client isn't there. really picking the feature. That's the that's the key thing, right? We're we what we're saying is is actually together we're going to make prioritised decisions sure. on what the best design options are. I suppose my my question is more: there's more than one way to implement any particular outcome. So if you get the better one between those two things, that you're both yeah, for sure, and that's why, I mean, it's just in the same way, like, one thing is, you want to actually have more than one design option, that immediately is a good thing, most teams are always just going down one track, so to evaluate multiple design options is, is already a good thing, and also you're always going to focus on those ones that have the biggest bang for buck, potentially, and normally if you use the kind of cost of delay prioritization technique, you want to focus on the ones that you can get some value out of it as quickly as possible to test that. And that just goes into the kind of, you know, usual lean startup and early discovery stuff. So it, it, minimizing the risk of your bets is very important. That's why we always talk about taking small bets across a series of design options while you're in this kind of okay. discovery mode. Another question and I'll point at you. Yeah. Uh, very bad. Yeah. When you're in a competitive bid situation. No, not you. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> he was going to ask very a hard question. I know. Sorry. 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 Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Um, how realistic is it to, to have that kind of um, KPI contract? If, like, let's say you know, the client says, I can improve my uh, quarterly uh, sales by 20%, I'll give you an extra 50%. Like, are you going to have to wait three months to get paid? Is like, I mean, how does that affect? Um, yeah, that is a good uh, question, and I think generally the, the approach there would be to have some kind of proxy or leading indicator that gave you a clue that actually you were going in the right direction. Um, but it's certainly, um, I, I haven't approached that personally, had to approach that specific challenge right now, because you're right, outcomes often have um, a much longer time horizon into when they're realised. Um, but actually, so for us, and this is where it maybe isn't appropriate, we are looking at doing work with clients that is lasting on the order of months or years ideally, really. We want long um, engagements. Um, when you are getting down to very short time horizons, maybe the way to go is kind of, you know, the more traditional approaches. But I think for us, it's about we're engaging in very high uncertainty and high risk and high value. Uh, and, and I believe that's actually what most software engagement should be about, to be honest, because software is inherently risky from the start. So if you're not got like a 10 times multiplier of a potential return in investment, I wouldn't even be doing your software project probably. That would probably be enough to rule it out at the start if it's of any significant amount of time. But it's a good question, and I, I think that's a challenge. Okay. Okay. Well, one last a cost plus award kind of thing anyway with that. Was that a cost plus award where the cost comes in early on, but the award is when you've met? Yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, and and actually that's kind of what we are we are doing effectively. We kind of have a sort of T and M component um, fixed to a certain amount of time. Okay, that was an illegal question, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I'll I'll give you one go at it as long as it's not going to be a fifteen-part question. I'll ask it at the end. Yeah, I was going to say, if anybody wants, I'm, I'm, I'm now I'm relieved that I've got this out of the way and I can actually relax. That's well done. That's really well done.